meter segmented lens has also been obtained. In future, a similar 10 meter Hundreds of high temperature chemistry processes are being researched in the academia. The first one is the solar thermal cracking of landfill or biomass process to produce hydrogen and solid carbon. The energy requirement for this reaction is 75.6 kilojoules per mole. And for economic viability of such a process, is the reaction temperature. Just go through the underlying portion. Hydrogen of 90% was obtained at a reaction wall temperature of the possible theoretical hourly outputs have been calculated a 7 kilowatt setup can produce 1.3 kilograms of hydrogen per hour a 50 kilowatt can programs per hour similarly a 125 and half megawatt can provide 23 and 94 kilograms of hydrogen per hour these are just theoretical without the efficiencies thank you welcome next one has already been carried out in the industry. This website snapshot of Birla Carbon depicts their six-step carbon black manufacturing process. They're using a similar method to produce a special grade of carbon black from natural gas. The underlying portion clearly mentions something like that. And sometimes natural gas are fed into the reactor in tightly controlled amounts. These reactor reactions occur in temperatures up to 1800 degrees Celsius and can take less than 100 of a second. It's the same thing that what's what the attempts by the scholars. The next one, Gautam, please. Uh, now to the potential second application. We have received this uh, unusual request from a student studying crystallography in an American university. The, the group wants to use the manufactured proof of concept to fuse certain minerals to emulate the Vernoulli process. Read what it is. The next one, Gautam, please. rubies, emeralds, and sapphires at temperatures above 2000 degrees C. The underlying portion clearly mentions this. Flame blow pipe and producing crystal drop by drop, much like a stalagmite at temperatures greater than 2000 degrees centigrade. We believe such processes should also be possible. Next one, Gautam, please. Altitude of research opportunities in universities and academia by making field testing in high temperature chemistry a routine subject. We are in the business to sell service and maintain such equipment for the academia, research institutes, and chemistry oriented startups. Concentrate on the chemistry applications and not worry about the solar concentrator and its peripherals. We are seeking traction from policymakers in India to provide India with its first solar furnace at IIT Jodhpur. We are the only ones supplying these commercial furnaces, sir. Finally, ladies and gentlemen of the Zaga August House, thank you for your patience. That's all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jain, for a wonderful presentation. I'm sure 
um, uh, advanced high temperature solar technologies would be a game changer for India. On that note, uh, I would like to uh, uh, talk about uh, our next speaker, Dr. Ayodhya Tiwari of Swiss Federal Laboratories for Material Science and Technology, commonly called as EMPA. And he is also the founder of Flissome, a spin off company in thin film photovoltaics. He has a mission to develop next generation high performance thin film solar cells. Sir, it's an honor to have you here. Your presentation would be just up in a minute, second. Next slide. Thank you very much for inviting me and introducing me. Uh, namaste, greetings of the day from Zurich. I will be talking about flexible lightweight thin film photovoltaics. And uh, before I go into the technology, just on a very basic level, I like to say it's like a fruit of basket where you have apple, oranges, banana. So something similar is for the photovoltaics. There are various materials, various technologies. Uh, they offer some advantages, some opportunities. And what I will be talking about is solar module manufacturing process together with a production plan. Why we say innovative? Because this is very rare it's not one of those hundreds of plants which you can see from commonly available film modules on glass where some traditional te technologies may have some prototypes for close to 14 and in the field of by my KL Chopra where I did my IIT, uh, from IIT Delhi. Then I moved to Switzerland and I established a research lab and we developed a technology uh, and ended up uh, founding a company, Leeson, uh, in Switzerland. Next slide, please. So, is a spin out from ETH Zurich, which is Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, known for about laureates coming from the institutes. And it's a, one of the top ranking technical universities in the world. And the company was established in 2005, and it has an exclusive research partnership from AMPA, which is Swiss Federal Laboratory for Material Science and Technology, and I'm heading the lab there. And some Company has developed the technology, not only the processes, but also the equipment. And we have a production plant in Zurich, as well as a, a very recently established production plant in Tashkent in Hungary. So there are two production plants. Please next slide. Mentioned the technology of flexible thinking, thinking CI gear solar new type of technology, but doing research in the labs. So uh, what you see on the left side 
uh, small type of solar cells, which is what we make in the lab. About 32 years back, we started developing a technology for lightweight, flexible solar cells. What are the deficiencies? From 10% in the beginning today, it stands to 20.8%. So when you scale up the technology from research to industry, there are a lot of challenges, and that's what company did. So today, the company FreeSum produces flexible solar modules with roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing. So that means basically you have a roll, and you, as process the devices, you unroll the foil, and you make the layers. You can see this type of technology of roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing has been widely used in food package technology. When you buy potato chips, a plastic coated with some metal and moisture barrier. So very high throughput type of technology. We adopted that concept of high throughput manufacturing, but for a very complex Device structure, which I will show you later on. So, we produce monolithically, monolithically connected solar modules with roll to receive on the right. You can see the very large size module very easily. So, next slide, please. So here what you see is that take a metal roll, metal film roll, but we thought that there are many advantages of using plastic roll because you can produce with a very low temperature process which consumes very little amount of energy to make monolithically interconnected module without using expensive layers or diffusion barriers. Or with a layer of molecule, which is a matter electrode, then we do laser patterning to isolate the areas to define the solar cells. Then we deposit absorber layer and buffer layer to make PN junction and find Finally, transparent conducting oxide layers. So, what you see is on the bottom the stack of the solar cell, roughly about uh, five micron of thin layers altogether, are grown on a polyamide film, which is roughly about 25 micron. For the reference, a human hair thickness is typically about 50 micron. So, what we are talking about less than human hair thickness giving you electricity. So this is remarkable that it can be done in a very efficient manner. So after uh, depositing all these layers, we finally encapsulate to protect against moisture, weather conditions, and you use the encapsulation depending on the application. So for buildings, one has to have applications or encapsulants, which will withstand and give you a good lifetime over 30 years of its operation. We use this film to develop various products, and we have different names, E-flex, E-metal, E-film, E-air, depending on what is the support on which the layer is applied and what is the application. So if if we go to the next slide, please.
aesthetic-wise, they are very uniform black appearance. One can, of course, change also the color. You will not start this. For applications, we can apply them on buildings. We can use them for mobility. This can be truck, bus, car, or even tuk tuk. They are very thin, lightweight, so they can be also used on air. And one can also have some customized products. Next slide, please. Applications which illustrate that traditional modules might have some difficulties for buildings or facets which have some limitations on the load bearing capacity. So, what you see, fleece and solar modules applied on roofs as well as on facet. And since they are very lightweight, easy to install, they make very good sense. Next slide, please. This is a very unique strength of this type of technology that you can give them a different shape. And again, so what you see on the left is a building, uh, old building, warehouse, where the roof is very old. So it was not possible to apply any other technology of solar module. You could not penetrate the roof. So the FISM solar module can be given in a curved shape, lightweight. So it fits very well to curved surfaces is a solar power port. So again, it's a very nice example of the uniqueness of the technology. Next slide, please. So these are further some examples. On the left, what you see on top is a bus on the roof of the bus. Uh, the technology of FISM is applied on the central middle. You see a greenhouse. So this means also some applications for rural for agriculture sector and uh, also flat roofs and other type of industrial buildings. So these are uh, different uh, illustrations of applications of ESOM technology which have been applied in almost about 23 countries. Next slide please. It is also honored and uh, has been awarded various uh, prizes recognition, including also some certificates which warranty the performance of solar modules. So with that, I would like to close my presentation and I would like to thank you all for listening and uh, for the pleasure to speak about our technology. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for the extraordinary presentation. I'm sure uh, flexible solar panels have a lot of potential applications in India and all around the world. Uh, on that note, I would like to uh, talk about our next speaker, who is Dr. Shankar Sridhar, who I happen to know for the last few months. He's a CTO of Norway headquartered REC Solar, which has its operational headquarters in Singapore. Shankar holds a doctorate degree in physics from University of Pittsburgh in the US. And before joining REC, Shankar was a project leader at Simflim Electronics AB in Sweden. So thank you, uh, Shankar, for joining us today. The introduction. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me on behalf of RBC. Uh, so good evening, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm from uh, Renewable Energy Corporation, or as we call it, REC Group. 24 years old. And uh, we've been in this business long enough, and uh, so we understand some core works and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm here to give you. By our marketing to visualize all, all over the world. And there's two Indian specific examples. There is, if you can locate it here, there's the same textile 
mills in Tamil Nadu where 3.5 megawatts was installed. And there is Minar Masjid Mosque in, uh, in uh, Mumbai, where about a small installation of 15 kilowatts was installed. Next slide, please. So at Glimpse, uh, as I said, we're about 24 years old. And during this period, we've installed about 38 million solar panels worldwide, uh, which has empowered six, more than 16 million people all over the world. Uh, we, we are about 2,000 employees globally. And manufacturing facilities in Singapore and in Norway. In Singapore, we have an integrated plant that produces wafer cells and modules. And in Norway, we have uh, upgraded metallurgical grade silicon manufacturing. Uh, the module manufacturing capacity in Singapore is about 1.8 gigawatts, where we consistently manufacture very high quality panels, about four million panels a year, uh, with a very low uh, claims rate of less than 100 parts per million. Next slide, please. So this, this slide, uh, in, in short, summarizes the journey of REC Singapore. Uh, so starting in 2010, uh, we were one of the first to introduce three bus power uh, modules. We quickly upgraded to four bus power, and then we became the, uh, the first manufacturer in the world to combine half cut cell technology with multi -cook technology. Uh, we called it the Twin Peak. I think it's very well known in India. And for that, we won the InterSolar Award in 2015. We switched gears in 2018, and we became the first manufacturer to launch half cut cell technology in conjunction with Topcom and type cells. And last year, we launched one of the highest efficiency products in the market called the Alpha, where we combined a half cut cell technology together with Heterojunction cells and an advanced interconnection technology. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a this is our Singapore site uh, where you can see that we have a wafer cell uh, module manufacturing plant and a separate plant to manufacture the n-type cells. The overall capacity is about one point eight gigawatts. You can also see that we. Next, the uh, research ecosystem in Singapore might be useful for India as you as you set up your own manufacturing facilities. So one of the good things about Singapore is that they have a very strong research ecosystem. So just in uh, uh, just here for us, the Solar Energy Research Institute of Singapore. There's Arion Energy Research Institute at NTU, SUTD University of Technology and Design, as well as A Star Labs. Uh, which are very useful for us to do and uh, development and also characterization. Next slide, please. In addition to this, there's multiple funding avenues for these research. So I, I gave some examples as the Economic Development Board of Singapore, National Research Foundation from the Prime Minister's Office, and the Energy Market Authority. And all these, all these uh, government agencies, they, they've come up with uh, research incentive schemes uh, to support companies to work together with the research institutes to actually fund R&D activities, which the company might not be able to do it on its own. Next slide, please. Uh, in, in Singapore, since Singapore is not the lowest uh, labor uh, cost country, right from day one, we've invested in highly automated manufacturing. And over the last decade, we've built it more and more more go towards industry 4.0. So we've invested in robotics, we've invested in advanced camera systems, sensors, softwares to capture all the data. We've invested in big data and analytics. So uh, we're developing more and more going into the industry 4.0. Next slide, please. And all this has paid off. Uh, so what you see in this uh, slide is the claims rate at REC in cumulative parts per million, and you can see over the last seven to eight years, even though we continuously change products, as you can see on the bottom, from our standard 60 cell product, we've gone all the way to heterojunction, the claims rate we've managed to keep quite low. And this is despite a lot of investments in the line, a lot of changes in the line. 
So this is the strength that REC demonstrates in, in terms of quality, uh, quality assurance. REC has been able to maintain a very high quality. And all, and all this we can see in real life testing also. So this is uh, installation in Rajasthan, uh, where the, the lines that you see at the warranty offered by REC, REC are the actual performance of the module after three and a half years. And you can see it's well above what is warranted by, by REC. So Degradation in these panels is significantly lower than what is actually uh, uh, in the warranty, and that, that shows the power of these panels. Next slide. And the orange box. So, so I'll I'll now segue from introduction to my company to the, to the most advanced technology that we that we invested in last year. So this is a product that we are now selling in India. It's 450 watt peak solar panel, 72 cell 450 watt panel based on heterojunction and an advanced interconnection. You can see the power density is 213 watts per square meter, which is the highest in the industry. The beauty about the heterojunction cells is that you have a very low temperature coefficient of minus 0.26% degree centigrade, which allows it to perform far better in hot climates compared to conventional. Result in a 9% reduction in LCOE in comparison to standard products. Because of the performance of this product, REC also gives a fantastic warranty on this product and we are warranting a performance after 25 years of 92% of the nameplate power. And because of the whole technology, we also reduce the lead content in this panel by nearly 84% compared to conventional panels. Solar reward for this product. Next slide, please. So this is a snapshot of the heterojunction cell. It's a symmetric cell. And it's a combination of crystalline silicon and amorphous silicon. So you have a crystalline silicon anti-dead vapor on top and bottom of which you deposit thin, thin amorphous silicon layers, dope and, and uh, intrinsic, and you top it off on top and bottom with transparent conducting oxide. Uh, gives one of the best passivations to the vapor, resulting in a very high uh, open circuit voltage, which is the reason you have a very low temperature coefficient. Uh, as I said, the, the paste that we use here, the silver paste for contacts that we use here, they're lead free. So that's the reason for the very low lead content in the module. Highest bifacialities of all cell designs, you can get more than 90% bifaciality at the cell level. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the other features of this product, because it's a, it's a, it's a symmetric structure, there's actually videos on YouTube, you can see this, that if you, if you push down on a monoperc cell, you'll see that it cracks very easily. Whereas on an RTC alpha cell, if you continue to push down, you can actually make it touch the bottom without cracking it. And so this reflects on the mechanical strength of this product and how it will perform in real life. Next slide, please. We also used advanced interconnection to join the cells together. So this is a low temperature wire, a low temperature uh, process, which uses wires with low temperature coating which bond the fingers on the solar cell during lamination so there's no high temperature manufacturing which means there's less thermal stress which means there's less defects and that we use does not contain lead so you have a you have a very low lead content in this in this panel next slide please and so all this as i mentioned earlier be because of the fantastic temperature coefficient this 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 panel performs extremely well in hot areas. And you can see that you can actually produce much higher energy uh, in real life compared to standard panels. Next slide, please. 
And this, when you put together with the warranty that we offer, you are actually getting 15% more warranty power after 25 years that you compare with a standard what, standard product. And depending on if you are joining the REC, uh, REC certified solar professional program, you can get a fantastic warranty of 25, 25, 25 for product performance and labor. Next slide, please. So the last thing I want to say about heterojunction is that if you compare with all the other technologies, we expect all the other technologies to reach a ceiling of around 23% in terms of efficiency. Uh, whereas heterojunction, the record efficiency is 266 and the industry today is at around 23.5 to 24%. So there's already 2% scope to reach. And in addition, this is the best bottom cell for a tandem structure, for example, together with a perovskite uh, uh, solar cell, where the efficiencies can go up to even 30%. So this is one of the main reasons for RBC investing in this technology. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide. I, I want to give a shout out to the IC India sales team, which has been led for a number of years by Mr. Rohit Kumar. And these are the rest of the team, which has been working hard to promote REC in India. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Rohit, for a wonderful presentation, also for throwing light on Singapore's research ecosystem. Uh, almost all IITs and IICs and the professors are listening to this presentation. I hope uh, we will take a leaf out of Singapore's uh, technology ecosystem and, and, and create a strong technology ecosystem in India to support the manufacturers coming and manufacturing in India. On that note, I would like to talk about our next speaker, Mr. Frank Mierlo. So he's from MIT. Uh, several years ago, he started 1366 to, to create a, a very advanced semiconductor-based solar manufacturing in India. Uh, we, we are in touch with him for the last few months. He's involved in uh, transformative wafer manufacturing technologies. Uh, Mr. Mihalo, uh, I will invite you to start your presentation. Thank you very much. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here today. Production in the power plant that we built in uh, in Malaysia. Uh, it, was a, it was a demonstration of the technology where we showed that we were ready for prime time. And uh, if you could advance to the next slide, please. Uh, to date, uh, we have uh, invested about $200 million in developing this technology. Uh, we started uh, uh, as you mentioned in your introduction, we started at MIT, and it's been a fascinating road to get to where we are uh, this year, uh, you know, more than a decade later. Uh, and it takes, uh, oops, it takes, uh, it takes, you know, new manufacturing technologies don't come along very often. Uh, if you think of today's, uh, you know, today's technologies that are now sort of having most of the market share, Perk, for example, Perk was invented at the University of South Wales in Australia in the 1980s. Uh, Sikorsky, which is the uh, the technology behind the mono wafers, that was actually invented in the United States at Bell Labs in 1954. My point is this: my point is that you know fundamental core new manufacturing technologies only come along every 50, 60 years or so. And what our team has done is we have invented a new furnace a new fundamental way of making a silicon wafer. And we've taken that all the way from concept to a, a uh, functioning pilot plant. And we're now ready to scale uh, to uh, multiple gigawatts. And uh, we are currently actively looking as to where we are to site the factory. And I can, uh, I'm happy to report that uh, India is among uh, the most attractive uh, locations. And, and that's doing a global search. The other thing that happened recently is the end of last year, we signed Breakthrough Energy Ventures uh, as an investor. And uh, uh, there's no false modesty here. Breakthrough is by far the most sophisticated uh, investor in, in, clean, in clean tech. Uh, they only make one single investment in solar uh, of the 50-some uh, investments they've made to date. And, uh, and that is 1366 after a uh, very thorough due diligence. So uh, uh, I, uh, yeah, know that uh, all of that is, is heading in the right direction. Next slide, please. 
So quickly uh, showing you what we do. So if you look at the entire supply chain, um, you start with uh, today, you start with silicon, you make an ingot. The ingot is then cut into bricks. Those bricks are glued to a glass plate and they go into a wire saw and then eventually you end up with a wafer. Then you use that wafer to make cells and modules and ultimately electricity. But the, the four steps that are, uh, that comprises the current wafer manufacturing, uh, those four steps, we actually collapse into one. Our machine, and if you can just click once, our machine, click once please on the presentation. No, sorry, oh, well, it doesn't, uh, never mind, go back. Uh, the, the, uh, the PowerPoint originally has that ingot picture disappear because what our system does is we have one furnace, you feed silicon in at one end, and then wafers come out continuously at the other end. And so that is, uh, that's bypassing the entire ingot production, the blocking, the gluing to the glass plates, the sawing, all of that is, is eliminated. And it goes straight from the hyperpure silicon to a perfectly formed wafer. And that, of course, uh, that means two things. That means that you have a, a much simpler production process. It also means that you eliminate all of the waste that is inherent and in the ingot and, and uh, wire sawing. And so we produce uh, two to three times more wafers per kilogram of silicon. And we do so at a much lower cost. Next slide, please. And so in my estimation, the best in class Mono from China is around uh, 29 at the moment. I think today I looked at the price at about 32 cents per, per wafer. I think if you try to duplicate that in India, uh, well, then uh, the, the cost would be a little bit higher for one uh, Chinese uh, equipment suppliers would immedi immediately charge their Indian customers 15 to 20 percent more. And there's a couple of other reasons why uh, the Chinese costs end up a little bit lower, uh, in part because uh, because of the extremely low cost of capital. So the cost of a mono wafer in India, uh, I believe, would end up somewhere around 45 cents. In comparison uh, with the direct wafer technology, because it's you know it eliminates all of these steps, and and instead of having four steps, we just have one. Um, we can produce at a relatively modest scale of two gigawatts, we can produce a wafer at 15 cents. And at a uh, globally competitive scale of 10 gigawatts, our wafers would be 10 cents. So that is a dramatic cost advantage, right? It's uh, one third the cost of the best in class in China, and it would be one fourth the cost of any uh, Me Too competition in, in India. So some, something that really can revolutionize uh, the way we look at uh, at the industry, and I think this is uh, is one of the technologies that's going to get us down to two cents per kilowatt hour. I'm particularly enthusiastic about getting to two cents per kilowatt hour because at two cents per kilowatt hour, green hydrogen becomes possible, and you really start to solve the entire climate change uh, issue. For me, uh, I started this company 12 years ago uh, in part because of wanted to make an important difference uh, to climate change. It's the second time that I'm spinning a company out of MIT. The first time was, uh, was an artificial intelligence company that uh, ultimately became part of uh, General Dynamics. And uh, that was a, was a huge success, started a whole new industry. And uh, I think 1366 is going to have an even bigger impact. Uh, but the next step is vitally important. You know, where do we scale? And uh, it would be absolutely Absolutely fantastic if there can be in India. Next slide, please. And then lastly, just a glimpse of the future. Uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the there was an excellent presentation by Shankar uh, just uh, just now, and he presented the best in class REC module. And REC is one of the best producers uh, on the planet. And his best in class module was twenty one point three percent of fish. So that is sort of, you know, the best you can do today. And I think, uh, personally, I believe that the maximum that you can get is a single junction panel 
is probably around 24%. I mean, there are real life limitations there. And then, uh, uh, as Shankar already uh, also demonstrated in his, uh, also mentioned in his presentation, with a tandem, you can get to 30%. And, uh, and so the, uh, you know, if you could have a tandem panel that uh, uh, gives you 30% efficiency, that's a huge jump in electricity. Very important, because that means that every installation is gonna get more efficient you know, you uh, you need a lot less land to get the same amount of uh, of, of of gigawatts, and uh, I believe that that is the roadmap for the industry. Uh, it's not so much what the Chinese are working on, but I do believe that uh, it's it's a way. That, you know, focusing on tandem is a way to get India ahead of everybody else and produce a product that uh, can be truly globally competitive. Now. Let's look for a second to that picture on the right there. So the way a tandem panel works is you capture all of the high, uh, you know, the high energy short wavelength photons with the top panel, and then you capture the infrared with the bottom panel. Silicon is 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 very close to the theoretical optimum for the bottom panel. Uh, however, if if you do the calculation, the bottom is only going to capture around, you know, 25 to 30 percent of the energy. The top layer actually has to do most. So but it's still you know, contributes to the total, co total cost of the panel. In a tandem module, bottom layer becomes paramount. It is so important that you have a cost-effective bottom layer because otherwise the total economics just simply don't work. And, uh, and of course, that's exactly what Direct Wafer delivers. Direct, direct Wafer allows you to have a bottom panel that can be extremely cost-effective, thus enabling the tandem architecture that gives a module that can be globally competitive. And, uh, and I'm very excited to, uh, uh, you know, to report that we are uh, you know, working on this and uh, the initial results look extremely prom promising. Tandem is gonna be a commercial reality much sooner than people think. And with that, uh, if we could uh, move to uh, the next slide, that would be great. So just to wrap it up, I think uh, I think it is possible for India to compete with China. Uh, the cre crucially, of course, is to compete with innovation and not capacity, because uh, the Chinese have uh, invested, uh, by, by my estimation, the Chinese have invested close to $100 billion. And so they have built up massive ex experience. Uh, they've developed uh, extremely highly competent engineering teams and they have a lot of capacity. And so uh, the, the weakness there is that it's mostly Me Too technology that was developed in the West. And there is an opportunity here to beat them with better technology. You still need to have a uh, global scale, but you can probably compete with China if you have a 10 gigawatt factory. It doesn't have to be a 100 gigawatt factory. And so, uh, and so you know, compete with innovation have uh, competitive capacity. I, uh, I think direct wafer can make a big difference because it can cut the silicon imports in half because we produce more than uh, double the amount of wafers per kilogram. It's absolutely possible to be cheaper than coal. And, uh, and this can create a second source for the rest of the planet. And, uh, and there is a real demand for that. People, uh, uh, there's a lot of countries around the world who would like to have an alternative to buying from uh, just one one country, which, uh, as as was pointed out at the beginning of this uh, session, you know, at the moment it's a real a real Chinese monopoly. And with that, I would like to uh, move to my last slide. Um, and uh, you know, we are very interested in uh, in 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 doing. During our next expansion in, in India, uh, we uh, we arrive with uh, two gigawatts pre-sold uh, because uh, 
we've done some excellent work uh, on the back of that successful pilot. And, uh, and then there, there is a vision of quickly expanding to, uh, to 10 gigawatts. So we, uh, we look forward to uh, continuing the conversations. And uh, once again, it was an honor to present at this forum. Thank you. A wonderful presentation. Um, I, I'm sure you know India would be a very attractive destination for your technologies, and a lot of other technologies could develop around your technologies. Start setting up an advanced manufacturing system. I'm going to just give you a second to 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 do the technical. Okay. Can you mute the other speakers? Hello. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I will just um, go on uh, with a uh, presentation. Um, in uh, my case, um, I will focus on uh, let's say PV production uh, technologies, maybe in a bit more general way um, across uh, the PV value chain. And but first of all, maybe some few words um, about um, about Fraunhofer ESA. So next slide. Um, we are um, located in uh, Freiburg, uh, Germany, and in principle, we are um, now existing since about 40 years and are covering more or less not only, let's say, the, the, the um, silicon um, PV, but um, also other topics which are, of course, very important for the um, energy transition, um, like um, uh, also um, uh, storage, um, as well as all the uh, power electronic issues, um, which are then uh, important um, to have a um, real um, um, development um, 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 for the for the for the entire chain um, um, of um, yeah the entire energy transition uh, technologies. So next slide, just to be quick with let's say the introductions so in silicon um, or in pv in general and photovoltaics um, it was already mentioned today of course that silicon pv is not uh, the only one but of course um, still uh, let's say the focus area we are also then working on three five uh, concentrators um, um, which in principle we just heard that um, in uh, for the tandem technology of course could be also covered in the future um, with um, the silicon as a bottom cell it's still i think a topic which is a bit more off uh, from the um, um, current um, um, market because it still needs uh, some further development especially on the cost side in the emerging pv section um, we are also working on the pair of skites um, so again bringing this uh, the two words uh, together and in the um, on the modules and power plant sides of course we are also quite active even also in india um, in um, 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 developing uh, power plant concepts um, and also um, assessing let's say the energy Energy yield um, depending on um, all the local conditions. Okay, next slide. Um, in the silicon PV area, we are running a um, um, full, more or less, uh, pilot uh, production line. In principle, even across uh, the um, entire value chain. So really, starting from um, um, from growing silicon um, ingots um, or um, either mono or even uh, um, multi-crystalline, um, um, then uh, towards the cell manufacturing of the different uh, concepts um, and ending up with uh, module production and system integration later on. So we can we can um, develop, let's say, the different uh, production technologies um, um, across the, the entire sector. Okay, so that was, let's say, only the introduction. So next slide. So the question is, so of course, um, we had that in the past. Um, if you look at the evolution of the um, efficiency also of industrial solar cells, you actually see um, over the last um, decade, roughly an 0.5 to 0.6 percent efficiency increase each year in industrial production. And 
in principle, over the years, you could see then the um, evolution of uh, the cell structures also. Uh, um, so from aluminum BSF cells, um, then into PERC cells, which is currently still, let's say, the, of course, the, the main workhorse um, in um, um, in crystalline silicon PV and the, the, the mainstream technology. Um, then uh, going even up, um, so um, it, if it's um, above uh, 23, 24 percent, um, we are now looking in to the um, usually, of course, um, efficiency improvement needs to go on. Um, the question will be what will come in the future, definitely of course, something like Tandem, which was already mentioned today, which in principle also then can be covered with all the um, uh, technologies uh, mentioned here. So Tandem on an heterojunction, I think, is something which is in the moment um, the uh, closest uh, to an industrial production due to the excellent work of uh, Oxford PV. Um, but in principle, Tandem structures, of course, can be also um, uh, realized on TopCon or or even also on perk cells. So it's definitely something um, which is an, um, a vision for, let's say, the next generation PV production in the future. Question is, of course, what does that mean for um, um, future production technologies um, uh, in mass production? Uh, maybe what is then needed? Uh, that's definitely, of course, a very big topic. And in this short presentation, I can give only some uh, snapshots of some technologies which may be needed, let's say, in every type of these uh, cell structures um, you see here. So, and that's a nice um, 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 overlap also with the presentation of Frank just before. So, on the next slide, in principle, for these high efficiencies, of course, the monocrystalline silicon material um, nowadays is getting more and more important. Um, so, we saw in uh, rapid um, increase in the share of uh, monocrystalline silicon, of course, mainly due to the to the PERC um, um, technology increase and uh, the the high efficiency technologies like heterojunction and uh, TopCon, which in principle are all used um, only uh, realized on monocrystalline silicon. So, or Schochalski wafers, of course, is a very important uh, topic in the market in, in the moment, and this is also fully uh, dominated, of course, by uh, a few Chinese um, uh, players, um, so like Longi, um, like um, um, uh, Songwan, and of, of course, beside let's say the direct technology we just heard of, uh, if you will stay still in the monocrystalline area, there's a kind of a re rebirth of the uh, monocast technology, a technology which is known for for quite long, but it never um, uh, popped up as a uh, relevant. Uh, technology. It's now an option, of course, to still utilize, let's say, the uh, multicrystalline casting furnaces uh, to even also grow monocrystalline and silicon. So there's a considerable effort now uh, done um, to um, re, uh, still um, uh, utilize uh, these uh, technologies. And what it offers as advantage is that you can then also be very flexible in wafer sizes. So that's also something, of course, which is uh, coming up. Uh, um, uh, quite that the wafer sizes are getting larger and larger, no problem with these uh, cast technologies. Um, it offers, in principle, a lower electricity consumption, um, which then comes along also with reduced CO2 emissions. So in, in, in a way, of course, if you look for a more sustainable uh, technology, then this is definitely something which is very interesting um, as low cost and sustainable um, uh, technology um, replacement um, to uh, the Schochalski growth. So this may be as an example for the um, um, for the wafer technology. So on the next slide, I tried to a little bit summarize another important issue in uh, production technologies um, nowadays in, in cell, mainly also in cell production is of course, to increase the, the technical throughput. So in the above short diagram, you usually see there the, 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 the roadmaps um, for production technologies, how, let's say, the, the wafer power throughput should increase uh, over the years, which usually then 
and also comes along with new technologies. Um, and um, the, the lower picture or the main picture here in that slide uh, in principle shows where we we are in the different uh, technology sections. It is, of course, uh, always then the question which type of equipment we are talking of. Is it inline? Is it batch? But you can see that um, basically for um, um, also in batch equipment by just duplicating, for example, um, uh, um, um, by duplicating um, uh, furnaces or um, uh, tubes, you can reach even um, with a single uh, production unit already um, um, wafer throughputs of uh, more than 10,000, even up to um, 15,000 wafers per hour, which means um, that you are then really prepared also for really large scale um, production in the several gigawatt level. For sure, this is a development, of course, which is um, um, ongoing and, uh, of course, then which needs to be um, also adapted um, for the entire um, uh, process chain. Next slide. Um, finally, I will focus a bit on, because that is also something where you can see very nicely the trend over the last years in uh, production technology improvement is the printing technology. Um, you can see here on the right, let's say, that's a, really the learning curve uh, for the finger width. So roughly a decade ago, again, um, the, the usual industrial finger width of a contact finger was at about 100 microns. Nowadays, um, with the latest stage uh, flatbed uh, screen printing technology, which is useful, of course, in any type of uh, cell technology later on, you're already in, um, at wafer at finger width of around 30 to 50 microns. And if you look at the next slide, um, you can also see how such a finger nowadays uh, look like if you really, really um, uh, drive it uh, to the edge. So we even achieved on industrial equipment um, with an um, industrial transferable process finger width of about uh, 20 microns with also nearly the same height. So you now really end up at, um, at um, cross sections, which are now close even to the sketches you usually do, where the finger is, of course, more or less and um, an, um, um, an, an usually in a very thin and um, high finger. So this is just, let's say, um, a result of the latest stage, um, um, fine line and um, uh, industrial screen printing paste um, and um, this is something of course which can be achieved nowadays for perk or for topcon or for heterojunction um, 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 as um, finger cross section so next slide and I think this is already close to my last but I mean it could go even further. Um, so if you consider, let's say, um, um, let's say also then uh, module interconnection technologies um, like the, the, the wire uh, connection. So then you usually also do not need any more the uh, boost bars. So you could also even then uh, decrease again, let's say the, the finger width. Um, with that, we have uh, created a new technology, which we call a uh, flex trail, where you pull more or less, uh, or where you push the, 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 the the, um, um, the ink or the silver ink um, through a very uh, thin, uh, flexible glass tube. You create, let's say, a kind of a trace on the wafer. And this, as you can see there, um, can go down even to below 10 micrometer in finger width and um, to really silver consumptions, for example, for a um, heterojunction cell with later um, a wire connection, where you can reduce the silver connection to around one milligram per wafer with still, let's say, um, efficiencies of uh, close to 24% um, on an um, for on an heterojunction cell precursor. So, as seen, the improvement and the um, technology advancements um, in that area is uh, still ongoing. So we are still on this uh, learning curve. We are still not at an end. And this is just as an example um, in for the production technology in that case for the printing technology. I think with that, I'm closing and hopefully I'm still within within time. Okay, thank you. Ah, right, yes. <laughs>
Thank you, Dr. Johan, for, uh, for an wonderful presentation. Interesting technologies uh, are explained in your presentation. I, I really think cutting edge solar manufacturing in India could take a lot of uh, collaborations with Fraunhofer and, and, and improve its uh, commercial performance. On that note, yeah. on that note I, would, I would like to invite our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Daniel Alban, CEO of uh, Vice President of uh, RENA, the production equipment of Solson Wafer, Wafer Technologies uh, for Solar Manufacturing. Uh, uh, Mr. Daniel Alban, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Can, can you uh, please switch to my presentation, please? At the moment, I see still from front of. Ah, okay. Thank you very much. So we are. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I am pleased to, to join this uh, symposium on behalf of Rena Technology. My name is Daniel Alban, and uh, I am responsible for the Indian uh, sales area uh, together with our uh, long-term partner uh, uh, IMC, also International Marketing Corporation. Uh, the topic. Today is innovative uh, wet processing equipment. Uh, we have the focus on mass production equipment and uh, have to master the challenge from from the uh, trend, from the from the market trend at the moment. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, before we start, uh, let me uh, provide you a brief overview uh, about uh, Rena activities. Also, uh, the headquarter is located in Gütenbach. That is very close to Freiburg. Uh, RENA was founded in 1993. It uh, 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 was a family company and, and later was uh, uh, switched to some uh, in, in some acquisition uh, phase uh, to, uh, to investor. Um, we have uh, 1,100 employees uh, and uh, this year we estimate a turnover of 180 million uh, euro output or sales. Uh, sales turnover and uh, worldwide, also in the, in the area of the wet chemical process equipment, we are a major technology leader with an installed base of 3,800 tools worldwide. Thanks. Next slide, please. So uh, our core competence is, uh, as mentioned, in the area of the wet chemical uh, surface treatment, uh, which means uh, a combination of machine and process uh, and their buy grade uh, added uh, value for our customers. You know? um, let me say uh, the green energy sector has a share uh, at Rena side of 25% uh, in, in total sales. Uh, we are also very well Positioned uh, in application markets of medical technology, semiconductor, uh, and glass processing. Uh, thank you. Next slide, please. So, if you uh, if you uh, check the next slide, you can see uh, more than uh, 400 uh, global customers are work uh, every day with Rena tools. Uh, we have uh, top references. Uh, from well-known companies, also from uh, Tier 1 in China as well in India. The year, uh, very well-known companies from India also mount our customers, and uh, here we are uh, really proud about that. Thank you. Next slide, please. So, uh, green energy solution, uh, for uh, PV or green energy, we hold our focus on mass production equipment uh, for etching, uh, texturization, age isolation, uh, cleaning, as well as plating of solar wafers. Um, we master the market challenge. Also for us, it's important uh, to, to follow the, uh, the market trends, as mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so high efficiency uh, and uh, high uh, end wafer surface, also uh, homogen uh, wafer surface is important for us. Uh, and uh, in, in case of high efficiency, uh, we have to handle uh, all technologies, also PERC, heterojunction, TOPCON, IPC, bifacial N-type, uh, and so on. Um, also IPC, we have a lot of experience. Uh, so uh, in the beginning, um, we also 
uh, have to help, uh, for example, a company like SunPower uh, uh, in, in, in view of uh, IBC cells. So that was also uh, one, one step. Um, we can say uh, cost of ownership is also a very important issue. Uh, as well, uh, high throughput and flexibility of wafer size, because uh, what is uh, at the end uh, important, uh, it's not a fancy technology, it's uh, to have a reliable system for mass production. Uh, mass production and also cost reduction is, is uh, a big challenge, which uh, a customer addressed to us. 80% uh, of the tier one cell producer are existing uh, arena customers. Uh, from this point of view, also we have a, a very huge market share in the field of uh, wet processing. Next slide, please. Um, can you maybe so I'm missing one? Uh, can you can you go back and, and make one click, please? One. Yes, please, uh, please make. Oh, okay, okay. There are missing one one. Slide. Slide or two, uh, two, uh, two slides, but I uh, like to explain. Also, if you uh, look about the, the uh, mainstream, uh, we see uh, that uh, Perk at the moment is uh, is one of the biggest biggest market, or the trend will be a follow a Perk or Perk or a combination with the option later into in Topcon. Uh, that is what we uh, recognize. Uh, the most of demand goes in this direction. Um, also, as uh, so, but uh, on on one hand is all. So uh, heterojunction is also a very uh, interesting, uh, um, interesting technology, but also capex is uh, from our point uh, at the moment too high, um, and uh, so maybe uh, is is a perk at the moment, uh, or let me say the balance of cell efficiency and capex uh, at the cell uh, um, at the perk cell uh, is pushing this technology. Uh, that is what we uh, what we at the moment see. Uh, um, in view of the maybe uh, heterojunction, or, or let me say, uh, anti perk cells can be maybe uh, provide a bridge or a gap, bridge gap uh, in the future. Yeah. As we see, maybe uh, here we have also some potential and uh, could be interesting. In view of the uh, uh, cell fab size, um, so we see in, in China, for example, uh, the most of, uh, also we, we see the trend to a larger uh, uh, wafer size as well uh, to uh, larger um, FAB sizes. Yeah? In China, the expansion step uh, are in a range of, let me say, 5 gigawatt, or we start at the moment by 5 gigawatt. In India, the market, of course, uh, we have some requests uh, in, in the size of 500 uh, up to uh, 2 gigawatts. No? Also, we see here also some, some difference. Um, if you uh, look about uh, the, the wafer size, uh, uh, the wafer size is a, is a big topic. Also, we have to also follow this trend with our equipment uh, because uh, that has a big potential to reduce the cost. Uh, uh, and finally, uh, by facial cells, uh, will be also gain uh, up to 80% in, in 2030. Uh, that is, uh, at the moment, of course, uh, depending or for power plants, it's a very interesting, as you know, uh, uh, technology. Next slide, please. So, if we uh, if we have a look uh, on the uh, perk process flow, or for the uh, perk standard uh, uh, line, um, our process uh, technology is before uh, before the diffusion uh, and after. Also here we have some uh, batch techs. Uh, alkaline uh, texturization process um, um, will be here uh, made, or the, the most cost efficient way is, is to use a batch machine. And here, uh, after the diffusion, uh, we have here some solutions, some inline solution uh, for uh, for a single side uh, isolation and PSG removal. Um, that is. Uh, overview where our products will be used. Thank you. Next. So uh, for this, for, for the um, requested market trends at the moment, uh, also M6 wafer up 12, 12, 
uh, up to M12 wafers. I think at the moment uh, the market uh, discussing M M10, M6, they like to start with M6. We need the right product. Uh, for this, we have uh, also uh, upgraded, uh, uh, was necessary to upgrade our, uh, our technology. Uh, so, so in a few of the market requests, we can recommend our batch text uh, N400XL version. That's a, a extent version uh, from the standard uh, version. It's a, uh, it's a XL version. The text substation process is based on uh, H2O2 pre-clean and O3 post-clean uh, uh, in combination with advanced uh, monotex or RENA monotex additive. Uh, the tool can manage wafer size up to 12. Uh, for the edge isolation, uh, rear side uh, polishing and PSD removal, uh, we have updated our inoxide system. The inoxide system is inline system, uh, uh, and we have uh, now six lanes uh, equipped with a RENA function layer in order to protect uh, the, uh, the upper surface of the wafers uh, with, a, with a water film. Uh, and optional, we can uh, also equip uh, this tool with the pre-con bars so that uh, you can also uh, use this machine for later uh, upgrade to a top con process. So of course, that is uh, also uh, opt optional uh, possible. Um, so this tool is also uh, available uh, to handle uh, M12 wafers. Thank you. Next slide, please. So uh, now what's happened if you compare uh, M6 wafer uh, M6 wafer to M12 wafers, for example. I have not uh, bring a, a, a sample for M M10 or, or the wafers between, but you see here uh, uh, a huge. Uh, also if you if you look about this slide, you will quickly recognize that la larger wafer size have a huge potential to bring down as a production cost. You know? Um, we have made here some cost of ownership calculation. Also we have combined uh, the batch text and inoxide and have, have uh, checked what's, what's happened in case of the uh, uh, chemical uh, area. You know? And uh, also uh, we have, you see here a sample um, for 500 megawatt, uh, what kind of uh, output you have uh, if, you, if you use our equipment for M6 wafer size. Uh, in uh, or for M12 wafer size. Thank you. Next slide. So um, we are also uh, well uh, positioned for the uh, for the future market uh, with our wet uh, chemical process technology. Uh, you see, the next generation is now ready for the market. Uh, we have designed a high throughput batch text with a capacity of 600 wafer per batch or let me say 12,000 or 14,000 uh, wafers uh, per hour. Uh, uh, first advantage is the capex. Uh, we have here also, we was also able to generate some saving uh, um, potential of uh, 15% uh, uh, compared to the wafers throughput. Also for us, it's every time important, uh, not the price of the machine, uh, important is the price per uh, wafers throughput. And uh, this is, I think at the moment uh, the trends this machine uh, uh, is already uh, sold in in the market. Uh, from this point of view, uh, we have here a, a good request or got a good request from our customer. Um, in case of the uh, inline technology, other one was a exhaustion, another one is is a is, is a PSG removal and and uh, age isolation. Uh, we have also launched uh, recently our Inoxide 3 Fusion. Um, this machine uh, uh, is, a, is a combination of uh, acidic and alkaline uh, process um, a combination, uh, and we can uh, improve with this uh, process, with our process technology, the cell efficiency about uh, 0.05. Also, that is a, a, a guarantee value. Uh, I guess uh, we can here also. Uh, uh, lift up or have some some potential, uh, and also uh, a first uh, very important issue is uh, uh, reduce uh, HO3 consumption by fifty percent. I think that has also uh, 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 impact a huge impact in in the cost of ownership in the production cost. Uh, 
uh, and also uh, uh, providing a significant uh, NOx reduction. I think uh, uh, that was also uh, very often in our discussion with company uh, with, with our customers uh, uh, a request uh, to uh, yeah, to improve this. Thank you. Next next step. Also, if you uh, if you make your uh, conclusion, or let me say, uh, let me finalize uh, this uh, presentation. So, for years, Arena Technology has been a pioneer in developing uh, of high performance uh, production process and uh, production uh, uh, technologies for large cells well. Right. Always uh, to follow market demands and reduce the infrastructure production costs within the chemical sector. Yeah. Uh, that is our core business and uh, here we are strong and um, that is uh, one of the key for success also in, in, in very price intensive markets like in India as well in China. Yeah. So maybe next slide. Uh, please next slide. Okay, so yes, yeah, it's a uh, uh, slide for me. Uh, first of all, thank you for the extension. Also, if you have some additional question or or uh, interesting, uh, so you can also for other uh, in in India, which is located in Mumbai, that is IB, uh, the International Marketing Corporation. Also, uh, my person. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Daniel, for, for an excellent presentation. I ensure the production equipment is an important part of um, part of the solar manufacturing ecosystem. With uh, with Daniel's excellent presentation, with, uh, with Daniel's excellent presentation, uh, we are, we have come to the end of our presentation session. Uh, now, now we can move on to Q and A, uh, question and answers. Uh, we can stop sharing the screens. Yeah, and uh, and uh, to, to begin with, I would uh, I would like to invite. The, uh, Amitesh Shinha, sir, if, if you're still online, to, 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 to provide your uh, opening remarks or the questions. Amitesh, are, are you online? Yeah. Yeah, please. Wonderful presentation from all participants. And uh, we were enlightened to know about the different technologies. In fact, uh, I uh, think that our developers and manufacturers who are attending this symposium will be greatly benefited from this. And uh, we can go directly for Q&A session. Thank you, sir, for your words. Uh, just from the audience, uh, I would invite anyone to just unmute yourself and if you have a question and, and ask the question to any of our presenters. The floor is yours for the participants. Uh, I request uh, Shekhar Dutt, sir, for his question. So uh, let me ask uh, uh, one question from 1366 technology, Kotham. So uh, I just want to ask them this question about uh, uh, multi-wafer. Mono wafer, the advantage and what benefit they are offering over and above uh, the mono wafers that is currently uh, in use uh, by different solar cell manufacturers. I just want to comment from 1366 technology. Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, when I was discussing uh, the technology, direct paper technology with Indian manufacturers and other developers, so uh, they told me that this is a, a multi, uh, uh, this wafer technology is not for mono, this is for multi. 
so uh, what advantage this is uh, or, or or what uh, financial benefit this is offering to manufacturers who are looking for solar cell manufacturing okay well first of all that is uh, you know the the best way to think about it is to think think about these things as furnaces and so uh, the the multi furnaces are based, built the multi wafers come out of a dss furnace and that is a furnace that makes a big uh, rectangular brick that's then sliced up in smaller bricks and and uh, and so on. And so then the, uh, the DSS furnaces were invented in uh, in Boston in 1973. Uh, the Sikorsky furnaces that are the basis for the mono wafers, they make cylindrical uh, ing ingots and that's then cut up and also sawn into wafers. Direct wafer is neither multi nor is it mono. Direct wafer is a third furnace uh, that uh, bypasses the need for sawing. And it makes a wafer that is uh, directly from the melt and, uh, uh, and, and then you get a unique wafer. And our wafer, for example, has a very different crystal structure than the classical multi wafer. It has much higher purity and it also has higher efficiency. And so, uh, in that sense, it's a more compelling product. Uh, but the most important reason that direct wafer is, is such a great solution is that you get two to three times more wafers per kilogram of silicon. So, you know, personally, I think that the one place that China, uh, that China has made such a massive investment that it's difficult to compete with them there is in silicon refining. Uh, you know, it, it would not be easy easy to uh, uh, to get to the sort of cost levels that they have there. And, and, and also there is a number of silicon refining companies in other places in the, in the world. Uh, there's, uh, you know, there's quite a large operation in Sarawak. Uh, and of course, there is uh, some large silicon refiners in, uh, in Tennessee and Michigan in the United States. So if you believe for a second that the industry that India has going to build is going to be wafer cell and module and it's going to compete on technology then uh one of the things that's important is to not spend too much money importing the silicon and the nice thing about direct wafer is that we cut that import by a factor or two or three because uh, we eliminate all of the waste in the process and we do that while making a wafer that is superior uh you know it's uh, it has a very uniform crystal structure it's extremely clean uh, because we make one wafer at a time we have excellent control of doping and so uh, uh, you know whereas you know if you make a big n-type uh, ingot you will see quite a bit of uh, resistivity variation we could make an n-type wafer where we have exactly the same resistivity uh, at uh, uh, you know with, with every single wafer the the production the production window is much more narrow and the science of manufacturing is really a science of reducing variability and the nice thing about our production process is we do that in a uh, you know in a very comprehensive ma fashion one wafer is really exactly like the next wafer because we control the growth conditions and and, uh, and keep something that is uh, is always the same and that also allows us to reach higher efficiency has that answered your question or or, or do you want to have a follow-up question? Thank you very much. I just wanted to clarify my uh, uh, investors uh, and uh, manufacturers who are interested in your technology because I, I wanted, this, wanted this clarification right from your mouth. So it is good that they also they are his hearing and uh, their, their queries are uh, addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, I invite Rishabh, Rishabh Jain from the Center for Energy, Environment and Water. Uh, hi, hi Gautam. Thank you so much for organizing this. Uh, very, very great initiative. One quick question to Frank again from me is that one of the things, of course, you've said the production process is very different, but in terms of the other infrastructure requirements, could you shed some light, say, in terms of water requirement, electricity requirement? What are the key things that you would be looking for uh, from the central or the state governments? Thank you.
So, uh, thank you for asking that question. Uh, we have actually done uh, quite a uh, careful design of uh, two and 10 gigawatt uh, uh, factories. And so we have all of that detail. Uh, I don't have it exactly at my fingertips, but, uh, but all of that is available and, uh, and, and I'm more than happy to, to sign an NDA and share that, uh, that engineering work. Uh, but we have a we have a very good handle on all of that. Thank you. Quick quick follow up question. The reason I was asking was I was wanted to understand is it lower than the the conventional process or higher uh, in terms of water and electricity? I mean I don't I'm not looking for numbers, but uh, technology the requirements. Um, it is uh, you know the the big savings come from the savings in silicon. Uh, that that's where. You know, that's where we really excel because we don't do the sawing and so we don't have that waste. And the other thing that we can do is we can we can control when we make the wafer, we have much better control than in the traditional process. So in our case, it's possible, for example, to make a wafer that has an edge of, uh, say, 118 microns and then slowly feathers down and the center is more like uh, 100 or 130 microns. And so you, you further optimize the silicon. You don't have to do that. It's absolutely trivial to make a straight wafer, but we can also do these 3D features uh, that uh, uh, that make, uh, you know, open up wider possibilities and, and, and further optimize the silicon use. It's in the lower silicon use that the big gains are. Uh, it is true that we have, we of course have a little bit less equipment and so we have less square footage because we only have one process instead of four processes. So the, the, the factories are a little bit smaller. You're going to save uh, some on utilities. Uh, you're going to save a little bit on, uh, on electricity. But that's not the big impact. The big impact is really the silicon savings. Uh, thank you, Frank, for, uh, for the nice answer. So I have one more, one more question for uh, uh, Dr. Johan from Frank Hofer. Dr. Johan, you are, can you hear us? Yes, still with uh, you. Uh, Fran Hofer is in, is in between, uh, you know, uh, basic research and, uh, and commercialization at scale. You have seen a lot of technologies in solar manufacturing going from a, a pilot level to actual uh, giga scales. What do you think, <laughs> for people like India, you know, if, if you want to go from, let's say, from a mega scale to giga scales, from pilot to, we want to be the, what, what, what you, what in your mind is key to go from mega scale to giga scales without losing the quality? Yes, I mean, first of all, I mean, if you want to be quick to go from 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 um, in, into the giga level, of course, you in principle, I mean, in order to be quick, you need to be um, um, you need to um, put your efforts on, let's say proven technologies um, so because that's the only chance um, of course to ramp up um, 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 the technology as uh, quick as possible um, so to have a certain ground of um, um, of uh, production capacity later on you can then i mean once you have achieved that um, then um, of course you can also consider and think about let's say um, um, new technology implementations etc but what we have seen in the past relatively often is that as an um, if you start something new and you already start with something um, um, very innovative it takes much longer um, than um, um, if you ramp up quickly with, let's say with improved technology maybe an example from the past it's already quite long ago so may not everyone still know um, but Q cells um, at, uh, um, in the end of the, the, the 90s started exactly that way. I mean, they were not very innovative at that time. They really just quickly ramped up up to, let's say, a gigawatt levels for a certain time. They were even the largest producer worldwide. And then they started, let's say, to set up their large R&D center is to look for different technologies, etc. But they had already in um, a backbone um, on uh, of uh, running production, and that's still 
build something and um, I mean these technologies in principle to ramp up quickly like we have seen from Rena etc today I mean that's all existing so there's um, you can really do it uh, you can really do it fast thank you professor Jorgen uh, that's a wonderful answer I have uh, one final question from my colleague if no one has uh, any other question I don't see any other questions coming up uh, uh, to to Dr. Ayodhya Dr. Tiwari, are you online? Yes, Here. I am. So Dr. Tiwari, you know, so the, the flexible solar panels, you know, such a wonderful concept. Uh, we are the, the, a lot of uh, car manufacturers which we engage are also very interested because India has such a large solar radiation and uh, and we have very small battery capacities in our uh, electric vehicles. But always the question is the uh, the question of efficiency. The efficiency has been relatively lower in uh, polymer based uh, uh, and uh, flexible solar panels do you see anytime soon uh, flexible solar panels reaching high efficiency levels uh, so that it can be used in automotive applications yes <clears throat> actually uh, this refers to also my answer refers to what you heard just before so when you compare the efficiency of uh, cigs uh, on polymer Mm -hmm. uh, basically, this is in the lab is as high as what you have in uh, multi crystalline silicon. Okay, so of course it takes time to get to high efficiencies, and if one will see the potential combining CIGS with uh, perovskites, our lab has already uh, in collaboration shown results of about twenty six point some percentage. So efficiency together with the cost together with the flexibility and lightweight would certainly happen but it's a matter of time so every technology from lab to industrial maturity takes time but i think the big market is uh, for buildings especially for country like india and many other places where the uh, land around the buildings rural or also urban areas that's limited so we believe yes automobile sector is an interesting opportunity, but building is bigger. And uh, yes, efficiency-wise, you have limited surface area, you have to deal with it. But uh, important is the vibrations, which probably many other wafer-based technologies would have difficulties. So you have to find an optimum solution. Yeah. For a wonderful answer. Uh, any any more questions from anyone from the audience among the manufacturers or the investors? More question coming up. Uh, so that we have come to the end of our session. Uh, thank you, all the speakers. I mean, the, the sessions were wonderful. I'm already receiving very strong feedback. Uh, all the sessions are recorded, and uh, all the participants and the registered people and the speakers. You would be ordered up. I would request our next which would start shortly in five minutes. Thank you so much everyone for taking your time. We are we are ending our session now. Thank you.